Good morning and welcome to 2023. I hope you've had a good New Year's. I hope you had a good uh, bowl season for football. Uh, Tom, back in the saddle today after going to see the Tennessee-Clemson game, the Orange Bowl down in Miami. Uh, I'm back and uh, Tesla is back in the news. Uh, some things don't change. It was in the news in 2022 and it's in the news kicking off, off for 2023. Tesla missed its delivery estimates for Q4. They delivered 405,000 vehicles. The estimate was 420,000. This basically puts them up 40% in terms of deliveries for the full year in 2022. Uh, so they're up 40%. They want to be up 50% year in, year out on average. Um, back in October, they did say that this would be a stretch to hit. Nevertheless, it's a little bit of a disappointment for the market, especially considering that they were offering discounts of up to $7,500 per car in some cases. They're saying that it's because of uh, a region, a different regional mix, which is resulting in more cars in transit. But nevertheless, it seems like uh, the, the pressure is on for Tesla, pressure is on for Elon Musk, and the stock is down almost 4% this morning. They're going to be holding an investor day on March 1st to discuss long-term expansion plans. Uh, capital allocation, which could include stock buybacks, which Elon Musk has alluded to, and a next generation vehicle platform. So as ever, Elon Musk, how do you battle something uh, that's perceived as a bit of a disappointment while you go out and promise something else? The question, Ben, is we've seen, obviously, a, just an unbelievable erosion in the stock price. You know, something we've always said is that Tesla is actually a pretty solid company. The problem is the valuation just doesn't make sense. Are we getting close to a valuation that does make sense, even given the fact that they missed these numbers? I mean, 40% growth is still excellent growth. I mean, 50% growth for any company is massive. Uh, so now we're seeing 40% growth year over year and a stock price has come down, I mean, like an absolute falling knife. You know, What point do you think it's, it's worthwhile getting in? I mean, if you're still valuing Tesla as a growth company, then it's cheap. Uh, but if you're valuing it like an auto company, then it's it's not nowhere close. I mean, it could go down another seventy percent. Yeah, because I mean, that, GM that's also down. For, yeah, call it forty percent for the year for last but, year as well. Exactly. So, so I mean, I I think that uh, Tesla its operating metrics are doing very well, but I think what you have with Tesla is that there's this thing called a blue ocean. When you find a new product uh, that has differentiation, that you can create new, more revenue from at higher margins. It's what Netflix employed. It's what um, the big one is Cirque du Soleil. That's used in all the case studies. The problem is that only lasts for so long, these blue ocean strategies. After a period, and it's pretty much like clockwork of eight to 10 years, you see that blue ocean become a red ocean. And I think that's what you're seeing in Tesla. You make missteps uh, on a corporate level. Uh, we've obviously known Netflix has made uh, missteps. Uh, you saw missteps at Cirque du Soleil. And as a result, and, and then you also see competition enter the market as well and turn that blue ocean into a red ocean. Uh, and I think that's what you're seeing is Tesla. Uh, you have a lot more electric vehicle competition. You have a lot more high-end competition. And this limited skew, high volume, extremely profitable business model that they have is now under threat. And I think that's what I would be concerned of if I was a Tesla investor. Yeah, I would definitely agree. But it's something to watch, I think, though, because it's, it's one we've sat out on in a long time. And I think that, you know, there's definitely a potential where it could become a company that we get in on. It's just a question of when and at what price. We, we have done a lot of research internally. We looked very seriously at this back in September and October. Uh, at Tesla, we ultimately passed uh, at $220 a share, which at that point seemed very cheap. Um, but now it's $120 a share. So, uh, you know, with these high growth companies, high multiple companies, it's difficult to know where that uh, the ending point is. Uh, it may be now, but I would bet against that, at least for now. There are better risk rewards, I think. Yeah, in the market. proceed with caution, for yeah. sure. Uh, another one that's having issues of a different kind is Southwest Airlines. Uh, Southwest Airlines just performed abysmally uh, in the... Uh, during winter storm Elliot, uh, despite having the name Southwest Airlines. Um, so they had on Sunday, Christmas Day, 46% of Southwest Airlines were canceled. On Boxing Day, 75% of Southwest Airlines flights were canceled. Uh, that is dramatically, dramatically higher than any of the other flights and any of the airline, any other airline 
in the United States. And this is unfortunately becoming a little bit of a pattern for Southwest, which has historically been the best operator in the space. And that is proving not to be the case over the last two years in the post-pandemic period. I mean, this is a trend we've seen, I mean, again and again and again in the airline industry, which is you see somebody, you know, take over a hub, create, create an airline out of nowhere, uh, scale them up. You know, they start to say, hey, we're really crushing as a regional airline. Uh, we're making a ton of money doing all these little routes. You know, we need to F, elevate ourselves and start to play with the big dogs. And ultimately, those uh, companies falter and then go bankrupt. I mean, we saw it with Value Jet. We saw it with, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, there were so many of them in the 90s. There was like five or six airlines at all. TWA. TWA. I mean, all of these Eastern, you know, throughout history, we've seen regional airlines try and elevate and then eventually fold or get bought out and merge with another uh, airline. So the question is, is Southwest going to, you know, trim their losses, cut the fat? Are they going to figure out how to continue to be this dominant regional sort of low cost airline, or are they going to try and elevate and at which point are they going to succeed? You know, so it's, it's been uh, not a great year for them. You know, the airlines themselves have not performed very well after, even after getting a massive bailout. Uh, you know, I definitely got to the airport ultra early uh, to fly to Palm beach to, for the orange bowl and, uh, it looks like they cleaned it up pretty quickly because the lines were not that long. And so I was sitting at the airport at six in the morning uh, for an eight o'clock flight. But uh, I don't know. I would stay away from the airlines at this point. I per in terms of the client accounts that I manage, you know, for the most part, they're more conservative and having airline exposure is not something really on the table. Yeah. And, and Southwest, the, the most fiscally disciplined of the airlines, but clearly operationally, they need some investment here. Uh, in order to improve their logistical systems going forward, it, it's either outdated, it's poorly managed, um, and that costs a lot of money. It creates a ton of headaches, and it doesn't happen quickly. So uh, I think that's a big thesis differentiator for Southwest that we'll have to evaluate going forward. On the macro side, the we had some good news out of Germany today, both on the unemployment front and the CPI front. Uh, the unemployment rate ticked down to 5.5% from 5.6%, showing remarkable resilience despite the natural gas pressures and all the other pressures hitting their economy. Uh, you're seeing that similar to the, what's happening in the United States. And then you also had a positive CPI print where consumer price inflation decelerated also. It seems like that is creating some uplift in markets this morning, Tom. Yeah, we've seen just an unbelievable buying spree uh in bonds since that number came out. I mean, just massive strength. We were actually seeing strength before that. And now that we're getting all this really positive data out of Germany, which, you know, arguably I would say is the most important uh, economy in the EU in terms of reading inflation, reading, you know, what the macro actually is. The Germany is probably the closest possible stand in for the US in terms of a European country. So, uh, you know, it's another, it's another small battle won in the fight against inflation. Uh, and it's another indicator that maybe we can get this inflation down without destroying the jobs market as well. Uh, so that's very, very positive for bonds. Uh, it's probably not, uh, you know, great news if you're hoping for more interest rate hikes in the short term. I think that that's probably going to uh, stall that expectation for the short term. So, you know, as we continue to see data, you know, we could see some wild swings in sentiment again, where we're, but we're back on the uh, everything's okay train. You know, which we've gotten on a few times and then uh, quickly gotten off, you know, especially in the last couple of weeks, we've seen rates sell off like crazy, uh, you know, so we're kind of reversing the other way now. But, you know, the question is, are we going to keep going that direction or are we going to see another indicator that we're going to have to raise rates more and we'll move, swing violently the other way again, like we have four or five times now? Tom, if I told you, I was talking to a mortgage broker uh, over the weekend and he was telling me what the rates are doing and he said, uh, let's say fixed rate is six and a half. If I told you that fixed was six and a half, what do you think the arm would be? Interesting. Probably four and a half? Seven. Seven, really? The arm right now is higher than the fixed rate mortgage. Interesting. Uh, no investors want the arm because uh, yeah. why, why, why would you not want the arm if you think that rates are going to go down? Yeah. And, and I think that that is the ultimate consensus thinking around Wall Street right now. And it's certainly you're starting to see some money flow there. Uh, the Europeans are buying uh, bonds. They're buying U.S. stocks, but they're really buying U.S. bonds today, uh, driving the 10 year bond deal down 14 basis points, as Tom said, on the heels of that German CPI print. 
Um, and you're seeing as a result is that money flows into the United States, the you know, US dollar is really strengthening as well versus both the uh, British pound and the euro. So uh, that'll be a space to watch if this is just uh, noise or if there's something more to that. Stocks are set to open higher this morning. Uh, the, people are talking about that this is a result of the China, the fact that China stocks were up overnight, but this was mainly uh, Hong Kong, not mainland China. And I think that that is simply a beginning of the year allocation. I wouldn't really look too much into that. Uh, what's more interesting, uh, Bank of America put out a note this morning and that they said that the recommendation reckon, recommended allocation to stocks by US sell side strategists. So these are your Bank of America head of equity strategy, your JP Morgan head of equity strategy. That allocation fell to 53%. According to Bank of America, this is a pretty reliable contrarian indicator when the, uh, the sell side indicator is at this level or lower, 12 month returns were up positive 95% of the time. So 19 out of 20 times in a scenario like this where sell side strategists are this negative, uh, you're up 95% of the time that compares to an 81% baseline and the median return was 21% uh, in all those situations. So for those looking for some optimism at the beginning of the year, I would point to that as probably my primary source of optimism going forward. Uh, the week ahead, we do get Fed minutes tomorrow. Uh, that won't come out till 2 p.m. though, so we won't be able to talk about that till Thursday. Uh, we also have ISM manufacturing and Jolt's job openings tomorrow that those come out at 10 a.m. Thursday is the ADP employment report, and Friday you follow it up with the full national employment data for the month of December. Tom, uh, as you look forward to the rest of this week, what are you looking for? Uh, obviously, how things trade might be a suggest, uh, indicator of what happens over the rest of the year, and any other macro data that you're keeping an eye on. I mean, the employment data, I think, is even more important this week than the Fed minutes. Fed minutes, obviously, is going to be backward looking, but the uh, employment data could definitely give us some some indication of what the Fed is going to be thinking going forward. If it's very, very strong, you know, there's a possibility we could see all of this optimism kind of wiped out. Uh, you know, I think the Fed is still very much focused on the employment market, uh, maybe more so than even other uh, central banks. And so if we see a very, very strong jobs numbers, I would expect a little bit of hawkishness uh, and some messaging coming out either, you know, through a mouthpiece like the Wall Street Journal or perhaps through the you know, some of the Fed members that, you know, like to go on the uh, CNBC circuit right after the Fed minutes. So we'll see what that looks like towards the end of the week. Obviously, that's uh, the big one will be Friday, uh, you know, so heading into the weekend, we might see a little bit of volatility on bonds. But for the most part, you know, we're seeing some very positive uh, green numbers to start the year. Yeah, and I, personally, I would expect that to continue at least for the next couple of weeks into earnings. Um, but we'll see what happens with that. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, uh, beginning of the year questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll be here uh, the rest of this week. Tom and I will be gone at a conference in Orlando Monday through Wednesday next week. But we'll, we'll be plugged in. We'll be uh, attentive. And uh, we're happy to We'll pr probably even jump in on some of the morning calls from there as well. Uh, with that, have a great rest of the day. And we'll talk to you tomorrow.